Okay, so we're going to move now just to outline what the learning objectives for today's session are. So basically, there are a number of areas that we're going to cover. We're going to look at providing an introduction to COVID-19 and what we currently know about the virus. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, understanding how COVID-19 can be spread. Uh, we're going to look at outlining measures to prevent the spread of the infection. We're going to outline the importance of using appropriate personal protective equipment when we're managing COVID-19. And we're going to outline the specific measures that are needed for resident placement during COVID-19 outbreak. So I suppose we start off with what do we know about COVID-19? COVID-19 obviously is a novel coronavirus. Um, it was first noted in December of last year and was associated with a cluster of pneumonia cases in the area of Wuhan in China. Uh, the virus spreads primarily through droplets of saliva or discharge from the nose when an infected person coughs or sneezes, which is why there's so much emphasis on the cough etiquette that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Most people infected with the COVID-19 virus will experience pretty much mild to moderate respiratory illness and will recover without requiring any special treatment. However, older people and those with underlying medical problems like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease and cancer are more likely to develop, to develop more serious illness. And as we know, there's currently no vaccine or treatments for COVID-19 available at the moment. OK, so how does it spread? Well, essentially, with any infection, we're looking at what's called the chain of infection. And there are certain points in that chain uh, in order for, I suppose, the, the infection to be uh, able to, to get to the host. So we start off with the infectious agent itself, and in this case, it's the COVID-19. Um, every infectious agent needs a reservoir. And in the case of COVID-19, as far as we know at the moment, it's mainly in the respiratory tract. We're still trying to find out a lot about the COVID-19. So there are some experts who say that we can say for definite that there aren't any other reservoirs. So at the moment, we are talking about the respiratory tract um, and the respiratory uh, part of the body. Um, so the next stage is then that there has to be a portal of exit. And in the case of COVID-19, that portal of exit is through coughing, through sneezing, and indeed uh, through touch and contaminating surfaces through that. And that comes on to the means of transmission. So how it's transmitted is again through either direct contact or indirect contact. And indirect contact is where people may be um, in contact with surfaces that have been contaminated with somebody who has COVID-19. Um, from the means of transmission, then there needs to be a portal of entry into the host. And the portal of entry, the portals of entry at the moment that we know of are the um, nose, mouth and the eyes. And again, this is why there's such an emphasis on not touching um, your face. Um, and the advice that's been given to the public is to avoid touching the face because that's where the portal of entry is. And then the portal of entries allow the infectious agent to get into the host. And in the case of the COVID-19, there are particularly susceptible hosts. These are, for example, which is relevant to people like yourselves, people who are 60 years of age and over. Uh, people who have a long-term medical condition, as we mentioned previously, such as heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, cancer, or high blood pressure can be particularly susceptible to COVID-19. And as you're aware, a lot of people with these illnesses and of that age group will be people that you'll be looking after. Uh, those with a weak immune system. So, for example, people who have had cancer treatment, currently having cancer treatment, people who are receiving treatment for autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, MS, and inflammatory bowel diseases. 
also people who have HIV or uh, people who've had an organ transplant or a bone marrow transplant. Because of the medications that these people are on, um, they are immunosuppressed and therefore at greater risk of contracting the virus. Another group of people who are susceptible hosts are those who smoke. They would be at increased risk of getting acute respiratory infections, greater risk of the infection lasting longer, and greater risk of the inf infection being more serious than it would be for somebody who doesn't smoke. Now, the reason for that is that in our respiratory tract, we have little cilia. And the cilia are basically one of our defense mechanisms to try and uh, prevent um, agents such as infectious diseases getting into the respiratory tract. Now, people who smoke, the smoking, the act of smoking itself can damage these cilia and the virus COVID-19 itself also damages the um, cilia in the respiratory tract. So it's kind of a double whammy for those who smoke. So how do we know or suspect that somebody has COVID-19 infection? Well, to date, and what we currently know, there are signs of respiratory illnesses that we associate with the COVID-19 infection. So these are things such as cough, um, shortness of breath, fatigue, but also complaining of generalized aches and pain, something similar to what you'd see with the flu. But the criteria, I suppose, that has the, the most um, emphasis put on it is fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius. So anybody with a fever of greater than 38 degrees Celsius is somebody we should immediately suspect of having a COVID-19 infection. With regard to older people, all of us who work with older people know that they don't normally present with the, the symptoms in the same way as younger people. So older people may not have the typical symptoms that we see in other people who have the infection. So you know when you get that feeling that there's something not quite right with your resident, they're not themselves, it may be that they're not eating properly, it may be they're more drowsy than usual, uh, it may be more confused, uh, or their, their lung function is kind of getting worse, respiratory symptoms getting worse, or loss of appetite. These are also symptoms that we should be alert to and that should allow us to or, or make us think in terms of does this person perhaps have an underlying infection and in particular COVID-19. So many of the features that we've talked about in relation to older people, they are very common and they can be related to something else. So a degree of judgment is required there. But certainly anybody who's not their usual self and is showing the signs and symptoms that we mentioned is somebody we should look at particularly as a suspect for COVID-19. So how do we prevent spread? What can we do to stop the spread of COVID-19? Well, there are a number of things that we do. Um, there are standard precautions, which we'll talk about. There are transmission-based precautions, and they include contact and droplet precautions. And the other thing is respiratory etiquette, and that's something that has been on lots of advertisement, on posters all around the country at the moment and throughout the world. So it's a key area for preventing the spread of COVID. Another um, method or another area we talk about and we've mentioned already is about trying not to touch your face. Because again, as we've mentioned, the portal of entry does include the eyes, the nose and the mouth. So if we were to touch contaminated area, contaminated surface, and then to put our hands up to our face, we could inadvertently um, spread the infection. Another uh, area that is um, very prevalent at the moment and we're all very aware of is the whole notion of physical distancing, which originally started as social distancing, but now because of the need to emphasize the physical distance between people. This is now being called physical distancing. And that's about, in the general public, they're talking about keeping a distance of about two meters between people. And that's roughly six feet. 
In the case of when you're looking after residents, we'd be looking at that, that physical distancing is more um, one meter that we look at. But again, what we do in terms of when we're greater than a meter from somebody or within that meter in terms of protecting ourselves and preventing spread, we'll be looking at later on in terms of personal protective equipment and of course, hand washing. Another area that's very important in terms of preventing spread if we have COVID in our centre is about appropriate resident placement. So we'll go on to have a look at each of these in detail. When we talk about standard precautions, standard precautions are called that because these are the standard infection prevention and control precautions that should be in place at all times to prevent the spread of, of infection generally in the centre. And these include things like the, the, the key elements of it are hand hygiene, use of personal protective equipment as required, the proper management of spillages of blood and body fluids, appropriate resident placement, the appropriate management of sharps, safe injection practices, respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, management of needle stick injuries, appropriate management of waste and of laundry, decontamination of reusable medical equipment, and of course, decontamination of the environment. And these are all things that are standard precautions that we, we adhere to in everyday practice, so as to ensure that we don't spread infections. The other area that has particular emphasis at the moment is, as we say, around respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. And that includes things like source control measures. So for example, covering the nose, mouth with a tissue when coughing and prompt disposal of used tissue um, and washing hands, using surgical masks on coughing residents when tolerated and appropriate. Also education of healthcare staff, residents and visitors of measures outlined above, including cough etiquette. And again, that includes making sure that there are plenty of tissues and bins around to encourage people, if, they do, if they're not using a mask, to encourage them to use a tissue, if they're coughing, um, or to cover their nose and mouth, and then to dispose of the tissue and clean their hands afterwards. Another important element of promoting respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette is posting visual signs uh, appropriate to the population served with instructions to residents, family members and essential visitors to inform people if they have respiratory symptoms and of cough etiquette. Hand hygiene is the most important defence mechanism in any um, infection uh, and of course that doesn't change with COVID-19. So hand hygiene is the first and last thing that should be done in relation to any care intervention and procedures in relation to COVID-19. Spatial separation that we mentioned, ideally a meter uh, between persons with respiratory infections in common waiting areas where possible. And this is obviously, this would apply then in the nursing home setting when we're talking about communal areas. And when we talk about resident placement in a few minutes, we look at what that means in terms of residents who aren't suspected or haven't confirmed cases and those who have. So the, the poster that you see there in front of you is just a, a, a simple uh, visual reminder for people and it's something like this that can be used uh, throughout the centre to remind people about coughing and sneezing and respiratory etiquette. So it would be a good idea to have this in key places around the centre for residents, for staff, and for any essential visitors coming into the centre during the emergency. So then we look at transmission-based precautions and what are involved in these. Well, basically, <clears throat> transmission-based precautions are applied for residents known or suspected to be infected or colonised with highly transmissible 
or epidemiological important microorganisms that are spread by airborne droplet or contact transmission and who need additional precautions to prevent transmission. And obviously COVID-19 fits into those categories. Transmission-based precautions ideally require the use of a single room with ensuite toilet facilities and with or without special air handling and ventilation. So transmission-based precautions are divided into contact precautions and droplet precautions. So what do we mean by contact precautions? Well, they speak for themselves in terms of precautions in relation to particularly um, surfaces that may have been contaminated. So generally speaking, contact precautions should be used for infections that can be transmitted by direct contact with a resident. So for example, C. diff, norovirus, and indeed COVID-19. Residents who pre present with diarrhea may have an infectious origin. When examining such residents, contact precautions should be adhered to to prevent staff and staff clothes, equipment getting contaminated. It's very important in these circumstances to wear a disposable plastic apron and gloves for all interactions that may involve direct contact with the resident. It's also very important to wear gloves if there's a risk of exposure to blood, body fluids, secretions or excretions. And as we mentioned previously, to perform hand hygiene after resident contact and removal of gloves. <laughs> 